So I think um, it, it, you're going to hear a lot of this uh, over and over from various panelists in, in various uh, ways. And I think that's a good thing. So um, I'm going to uh, try to uh, enforce um, a little uh, of what you've heard already and, and, uh, and, and maybe some advice for earlier medical students here. Um, I think the first question that may come up for some students is, is whether neurosurgery is even the right specialty for you. You may love the neurosciences, you may love surgery, but you're just not quite sure yet, and that's okay. Um, it takes time to figure out if neurosurgery uh, is the right specialty, or it may take time for you. Um, I think some people do know right away that's, that's the only thing they want to do, and others want to consider other specialties, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but some questions you may want to ask yourself. Um, do you have a love for neuroanatomy and its intricacy, uh, physiology, uh, brain, mind, and behavior, et cetera? Um, are you a craftsperson? Do you love using your hands to fix things? Um, really important question. Do you love spending a lot of time in the operating room? Uh, there's really only one way to, to figure that one out, and that's by spending a lot of time in the operating room. So that's why we always encourage uh, uh, medical students early on who are considering neurosurgery to see uh, if they do, uh, to spend time in the OR and see if that's something they love doing. Um, how do you tolerate long hours um, standing on your feet for many hours a day uh, and fatigue? Uh, does the pace of neurosurgery and, and uh, potentially critically ill patients uh, suit you and how will you deal with um, what are sometimes difficult outcomes in, in some of our patients? Um, do you have academic and research aspirations that align with what you want to practice in medicine? Uh, what else could you see yourself doing um, that may not be neurosurgery that you may be equally happy doing? Um, that's a common one you'll hear from advisors. And then what are your life goals? Um, how much, uh, how much uh, do you want to be on vacation versus committing yourself to a vocation? And um, there is, of course, a, a, a balance that um, uh, can, can be struck there. But uh, these are all important questions that um, I would encourage you to ask yourself. Uh, here's a great quote from Harvey Cushing, uh, the, the father of modern neurosurgery. If a doctor's life be not a divine vocation, uh, then no life is a vocation and nothing is divine. Okay, um, what does it take to match into neurosurgery? Uh, you've heard about this a lot, but I want to um, uh, maybe provide some data to support uh, some of what we're talking about today. Um, there's no doubt you need discipline, commitment, and a love for the craft. And I think that is what you're hearing from the chair people today and program directors about um, the, the uniqueness of what we look for in applicants uh, um, who, who show this. Uh, uh, grades, research, and leadership, there's no doubt about that. I think a potential for future leadership is a big one. Um, board scores, uh, yeah, yeah, important, but fading out, as we heard. Um, AOA, if your school does offer that or the equivalent, um, is something we do look at. Um, and you have to ask yourself, what, what's your social support system, um, who your mentors are, and whether you have, uh, as Dr. Giannata mentioned, the, the resilience and grit to get through the training, uh, et cetera. So let's look at the data from, uh, from 2020. Um, this is a uh, provided from the uh, um, NRMP. Uh, it's publicly available to all of you to look at for every specialty and, and for programs. And it provides some insightful statistics. Now, remember, these are just statistics. This, this may not apply to you, and, and there are undoubtedly standouts, but um, these are just general guides that you can use to help make some decisions. Um, it shows comparisons of matched versus unmatched applicants. And you can, you can look down for yourself and see how many programs they ranked, um, uh, almost 16 in the matched versus 10 in the unmatched group. Here are the step one scores. Um, not, not a huge differential there uh, for that one. Uh, research experiences, again, not a huge differential. Uh, AOA membership, um, not a big difference in PhD degree. So, um, so again, you, uh, you have to ask yourself, what, what is it that sets um, these applicants uh, apart? We'll get into a little more of that data. Um, probability of matching. This is a this is a good graph to look at. As you rank uh, more contiguous programs, when you get up above uh, uh, seventeen or eighteen programs, your probability of matching does not go up tremendously beyond that point. So, um, keep this in mind as you're um, casting applications. Um, also, noting that that um, uh, uh, during especially during the COVID years, it may be easier to apply to more uh, programs. Um, but uh, this can be logistically challenging as things start to open back up again. And here's that same uh, probability of matching 
according to step one score. Again, this, uh, this may not hold true for years to come, but uh, a general guide. And I, I completely agree that we use this as more of a screening tool than anything else. Okay, here are um, step one scores of matched versus unmatched uh, uh, USMD seniors. Um, it shows you just the, the uh, essentially a standard bell curve for both of these, but you can see where most successfully matched applicants uh, end up here. And, and similarly for step two uh, CK scores. So um, uh, again, this is all public data you're welcome uh, uh, to look at. And in terms of research projects, um, uh, it looks like an overwhelming majority have five or more uh, uh, research projects they were involved with. And similarly for abstracts, presentations and publications. Uh, I, I do think research is a major differentiator. It's one way as a student to really make yourself um, uh, to the extent possible, stand apart from uh, your, uh, um, uh, uh, the, essentially your competition when you're applying to these very uh, challenging uh, uh, programs to get into. AOA membership, another benefit um, that, uh, again, just really shows a, 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 a broadly um, a, a potentially a, a, a suitable applicant for clinical medicine and, and, uh, and taking care of patients and, and, and performance on rotations and a, a diversity of rotations there. And then there's also a benefit of coming out with a, a coming out of a medical school that has uh, uh, that is highly ranked for NIH funding. So there does appear to be an advantage uh, as far as that goes as well. Now, again, these are just rough guides, uh, but um, again, just showing you what um, uh, who uh, seems to perform successfully in the match. This graph is from 2018, not 2020. It just shows uh, the proportion of seniors that got their picks in the match. Um, so about half of people get their first choice, and then you can see the distribution beyond that. All right, so this is really insightful data that the NR, uh, NRMP started gathering um, when they're uh, actually polling uh, program directors about what, uh, what program directors look for in suitable applicants. And uh, um, this is the um, uh, percentage of programs citing each factor and mean importance. Again, um, in selecting applicants to interview, not, in, uh, not once they've interviewed people and are actually ranking, but um, how they do their screening essentially. So you can see step one is, is used as a screening tool as our letters of recommendation followed by step two. So this will probably change over the next several years, but um, you, you can see there has to be an objective screening measure when we're selecting uh, candidates to interview just um, because of the sheer number of applicants uh, that we get. And I, I will share uh, some of that with you. Okay, what about um, what program directors care about uh, when they're ranking applicants. So number one here, interpersonal skills. So um, I can tell you when, when we sit down at interviews uh, um, or, or conduct these over Zoom, this is a really important one. I, I always like to um, uh, almost pretend I'm a patient and you're meeting that, their, their neurosurgeon for the first time in a clinic visit. And the way someone conducts themselves uh, in an interview and their interpersonal skills really says a lot about that person and, and whether um, you think their style will, will interact with your programs in terms of training for the next seven years. Uh, interactions with faculty during the interview and visit, so along the same lines, interactions with house staff. So the way that person interacts with, with uh, people in their surrounding is absolutely critical. Interpersonal skills, always be polite, courteous, and professional, whether you're on a phone call, Zoom meeting, interview, dinner, rotation, etc. I can tell you every program has their version of a veto where uh, uh, someone may not uh, display optimal behavior and, and gets um, downgraded in terms of uh, the rank list uh, because of their uh, uh, interpersonal skills. Okay, so uh, what is kind of the workflow that programs look at when they're screening and interviewing and ranking? Um, uh, for an, a, an average program with two positions in the match, uh, they'll um, receive uh, uh, 283 average applications, and you can see how that immediately gets pared down to interviewing around uh, an average of 46 uh, candidates, um, uh, sorry, uh, inviting interviews to 46, actually interviewing an average of 34, and then ranking uh, an average of 28. So um, pretty, pretty stiff competition there. This may be outdated soon. This was kind of this, the, the screening threshold 
where some programs may not consider granting interviews based on a step one score of around 230 or so. Um, again, maybe outmoded. We use this as a, as a loose guide, uh, but we do interview uh, people who are standouts below what our standard uh, uh, screening thresholds are. And I think um, most programs have some version of that. Here's the percent of uh, what U.S. seniors applying look for in terms of programs. Number one, overall goodness of fit, how well a program fits them. And, and you heard from Dr. Liao, that's really the, the inverse of what we look for. We look for uh, applicants that will fit our program well. So uh, really that's what everyone's looking for. Um, how was their interview day experience? Very important. Um, although I will tell you that um, sometimes it may be worth uh, doing a second look or a sub I or some version of that to see how a program functions um, not on their interview day. Uh, geographic location came in next, uh, quality of residence, reputation of program actually a little lower, quality of faculty a little lower, et cetera. So uh, again, just as a guide for you. And then, uh, and then what, do, uh, um, what are the factors as polled by uh, program directors in determining a resident's success? Professionalism, quality of patient care, clinical competency, ethics. These seem to, to, to mimic our core competencies in residency programs. Uh, very, very important uh, uh, principles uh, um, that we look for in, in our, uh, our house staff. Okay, so I'll start to wrap up here. Um, what can you do, especially early on in medical school, to get involved? And I think that the timing of it is important. The earlier that you can get involved, it will probably behoove you and, and serve as a benefit to you. Because I think one thing that um, people look for in terms of program directors and chairs is um, at the bottom here, a long-standing, unwavering commitment to the specialty. So if you can demonstrate that this is something you, you've committed to and you've been interested for a long time, I think that kind of shows up. Um, uh, and it doesn't mean you can't change your mind and decide to go into neurosurgery as a third year or, 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 or even rarely as a fourth year, but, um, but uh, again, getting involved earlier helps. So some resources, join your AANS med student chapter. If you don't have one, then start one. Uh, find a mentor who is a member of the AANS, uh, and you can start that chapter, your med school, if it, if it does not exist. Get involved with uh, various organizations. This is, this is easier now during the COVID Zoom era. So um, uh, the Young Neurosurgeons Committee, great resource. Volunteer yourself. The Medical Student Training Center, another great resource, et cetera. Uh, meet your chairperson, program director, and coordinator early just to let them know who you are and that you, you may be interested in neurosurgery. Again, this goes back to my last point here, um, longstanding commitment. Shadow residents, um, find some resident mentors, maybe at the junior and senior level. As I mentioned, get in the OR, go to clinic, uh, go to grand rounds. Research, get involved early. Um, we have a whole panel on research. I won't, I won't delve into that, but it, it will likely become even more so of a differentiator. Go to conferences, whether they're grand rounds, resident teaching sessions, et cetera, um, and go to the anatomy lab uh, uh, to, to learn some of that um, surgical neuroanatomy that can dovetail with your, your medical student neuroanatomy. Go to courses. A lot of these are open for free to students. Um, every med school has their version uh, of that. Probably most important, find mentors that you want to be like. I cannot emphasize this one enough. Uh, this is life-changing for most people who go into a, a craft uh, and academic practice such as neurosurgery. These are just some of my mentors, Dr. Weiss and Dr. Giannata, who um, I, I could not have done without. And residents can be phenomenal mentors as well, as can scientists. Um, research, I'm not gonna talk about, I'm actually gonna skip this because we have such a great panel, but uh, a big decision is whether to take a year off and you'll hear some some, uh, some various uh, perspectives on that. Finally, only you can make this decision and uh, you can talk to people around you. You can talk to your mentors. Ultimately, you have to make a decision that's comfortable for you after getting all the advice that you can. And remember that medicine and surgery is a service industry. We are here at the service of our patients and families and that will never change. Neurosurgery is no exception, no matter how quote unquote elite or advanced it is. Here's a great quote from uh, Khalil Gibran. Uh, I slept and I dreamed that life is all joy. I woke and I saw that life is all service. I served and I saw that service is joy. It's one of my favorite quotes. Um, finally, enjoy the ride. It's a great ride. It's a transformative ride. 
I love showing this because um, uh, we do have some healthy competition with the surrounding West Coast programs. Um, I'm uh, pleased to announce that uh, USC uh, uh, is is the still undefeated uh, winner of the West Coast Neurosurgical Games 2018 and 19. Okay. And by default, 2020, and that trophy is still behind me on my shelf. So uh, come and get it, uh, other programs. Um, here's uh, resources for all of you. The NRMP is a great resource. Talk to your program coordinator. They, they know where all this data lives. And finally, thanks to everyone uh, who made this uh, program uh, possible today. Uh, good luck out there and feel free to reach out to me. My email address is here, gzada at usc.edu. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.